Welcome to a brand new episode of Skillet's Worlds. I'm here with not only a good friend, but somebody that I've idolized for such a long time. He's a rapper, he's a comedian, he is a writer, and he's an actor. Um, shout out to Ben Bailey Smith, also known as Doc Brown. Thank yes. you for joining me, man. <laughs> it's an absolute pleasure. No, but no, no, it the really pleasure's is. all right, bro. No, it really is. It's like when you get to a stage in your life where so many elements of your work involve your friends or people you get on with, yeah, you're like, oh, this is what success feels like. Mm. I think I, I always used to think it's a certain amount of external accolades, maybe a BAFTA or a... a uh, a Brit Award or something for Mojo for um, Mojo. What am I talking about? Mobo for for music or something like that. Um, money, yeah. But actually, you get to a stage where you're like, wait, I'm doing whatever the fuck I want every day. You can see <laughs> I'm, that as well. I'm playing. I'm having a good time, and uh, the majority of the time, I'm doing it with my friends. Yeah. And so I, it genuinely is a pleasure. Thank you, my brother. I really appreciate you saying that. And also, it, like you just said, you do what you want every day. I, that that's senses has been there for a long time i mean i know because i followed your career from a really early age i know there was a time where you were doing the music and obviously had to work different jobs but there was a time in your life where i felt you just it just took off for you absolutely yeah like because i think i've got what like five or six years on you yeah so when you first would have like when we first would have crossed paths i still would have been working as a youth worker which That's was true. an amazing job yeah not making any money off rap um, but doing rap kind of for fun. Mm -hmm. And it was a cool, like, I loved being a youth worker, but at the same time, I knew I wasn't doing what I was meant to be doing. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, in some I, ways you were. Absolutely. In, in a lot like, of ways it's important yeah. that I did it and it it was something that I, I really enjoyed. I just knew exactly what my calling was from when I was a, a little kid. Absolutely. So it was, eventually it became frustrating, but I still did it for 10 years. And you still enjoyed it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it it was 2008 when I, I started, I, when I tried comedy. So it's 16 years ago. So That's 16 crazy. years I've just been going like, I'm just going to do what I want to do and see what happens. We're going to talk about all of that because I, 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 I remember my, re I'm going to get into it when we, when we circle back to it. But I remember my first reaction of when you first started to do comedy because I've known you such a, as a, as a. Always fascinating to hear this. Like. Because, but the funny thing is about it is, even though I did, I, I saw you as a serious rapper, you present yourself as a serious rapper, you did have comedy elements in a lot of your songs. Like, there was, I remember in Citizen Smith, you had a song uh, called Italian... Italian Swagger. Right. It's actually really a racist song when I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to talk about this? It's, it's such a good point because I never even thought about it when I started doing comedy. I always I, loved I, that I, song. I'd, I'd forgotten completely that I'd done that on the first ever release that I did this this mixtape Citizen Smith there was a tune called Italian Swagger, Swagger. which yeah. it was really born out of me and my brother Luke Skies we just loved Italian gangster movies I mean who doesn't especially right. in the hip hop world it's right. kind of like and especially that era it. as well yeah. the era you grew up in as absolutely. well absolutely so you know being kids in the 90s it's like Goodfellas is the ultimate like Italian movie and it's just before Sopranos um hits you and changes everything and like but within rap you know you listen to Wu-Tang or whatever yeah. like Nas and The Firm it was like all it was sort of like intrinsically linked mm -hmm. because r rappers from that era aspired to having the same sort of intelligence and networks not even necessarily criminal but like looking up to like these cool in their eyes cool people who do whatever the fuck they want to do and they're like a family and they're like a team. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And they're, they're funny and they're swaggy and, you know, yeah. it just sort of fit hip hop's persona. So anyway, by the time Sopranos came out, we were just hooked. <laughs> and me and my brother literally, like, we just talked to each other in these ridiculous, like like I say, borderline racist Italian accents. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah, you know? yeah. And um, uh, I it just spilled over into like, but it's, but, it's, but it's also you just showing your humour. Yeah, humor. because I thought like, I think at the time I thought if they're gunning me, then I'm not punching down. That's right. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, it's yeah. like I'm punching myself in the face, which also was something I would do in, you know, the closest I got to a job in hip hop was probably hosting. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's funny seeing you, you're so natural at it. Thank you. And it, remi it reminds me 
of how well suited I felt to it. Mm -hmm. Cause I always felt like, um, I like, bef I always wrote raps when I was a kid, but I never thought I could be a rapper because I thought you just had to, you had to be hard. I you had that. to have at least dealt some serious drugs. Totally understand you that. had to have hurt somebody or been in a situation like that. And of course that was another form of like racism or prejudice in my mind mm -hmm. about what rap really was. You know, yeah, and the fact that ninety nine point nine percent of the people that I looked up to and rappers that I loved around the world were people who distinctly have moved away from negativity. Maybe talk about it, but they're living a positive version of themselves. That's right. Yeah. Um, absolutely. So yeah, like I thought the the most natural thing for me, aside from rapping, was to be a sort of cheerleader for rap, mm -hmm. to be a sort of a, a presenter of good hip hop, a curator almost. And because I was a youth worker, it was also natural for me to stand in front of young people and go, this is what we're doing today. Amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. So Deal Real came along at the perfect time for, for that the record shop. For, yeah. for those who are probably too young or whatever, who don't, haven't heard of it, it was like a sort of Mark II. There was an old Deal Real and a new Deal Real and the new one was run by these four young black guys who I looked up to so much. Um, <laughs> yeah, two Nigerians, yeah. a Ghanaian, <laughs> and a, a Botswanan. What did you say? Is it Botswanan? Bots Botswanian? Bots Botswanian. Botswanian. Botswanian, yeah. Botswanian. Seth Karma. Um, just four great guys. And, and they, 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 I still, it still baffles me. They got a shop where Diesel is now on Carnaby Street, mm. uh, rented it out. And it became a hip hop hub or a little record shop. And well, it's, that's, it's mad to think about now because that's an impossibility unless you're a millionaire. That's the introduction of us, the Alberts, my, myself, my mm. brothers, and my good friend, Lat, shout out to Lamar Melvin. Uh, our introduction to you yeah. uh, was through those, uh, the deal real shop, the tapes, the tapes used to leak. We wasn't, I mean, I don't know if, because I was a bit too young to go. But maybe Loud and Mental might have went a few times. I'm sure. I, I think they there. did. Yeah, I think they did. So that's probably even more reason why they knew about the tapes and whatnot. But I was too young to go, but I used to digest everything my brothers would do. I used to like, every time they would of bring course. any hip hop albums, I would listen to it. Anything on TV, I will watch it because they were watching it. So they used to bring these cassette tapes. And I vividly remember, I think there was a cassette that floated around. I believe it might have been Kung Fu. And this is when they were doing battle in battle stages. Was, right. I think it might have been Reveal battled somebody. Let me Reveal might have battled Chester P. From okay, Task so Force. that was that was FKO Raw, that's, which was a that's night. It was a night that happened at Subterranea, which was up the road from me in Labrick Grove, so under the Westway. And you performed. Yeah, so that that was sort of the night I would say that Poisonous was really born because right. we already sort of existed, but only sort of amongst ourselves. Right. So initially it was me and Reveal, then it was me and Reveal and Therapist. Then we met Tony at a cipher right. in Clapham. And it was kind of the four of us. And we were, we were already like recording, but mainly just ciphering with each other and stuff like that. But that night I was doing a PA, uh, Estelle and Rosie, Rosie's Gabor was doing yeah, a Rosie PA. Gabor, yeah, Roots Maneuver yeah, was doing a PA. Yeah, yeah. And But the main event really was FK Roy is like a bo full-size boxing ring. That they set That's up correct. in the middle of the That's venue. Right. I right. think Shorty Blitz hosted, and mate, like some of the <laughs> like the levels of of that battle. Reveal was in it. Chester P was in it. Yep. Cyrus the Virus. That's was right, in it. the Dark MC. Um, I can't remember anyone whack being in it. I remember Cyrus the Virus had a bar set. He said, "Cyrus the Virus, the Dark MC, grab the microphone, make people the MC." While you want a battle, you ain't got weapon. Looking like black, you at an S Club Seven. <laughs> <laughs> and he had a he had a Classic. he had a sick voice as yeah, well. Yeah, Cyrus, like it was like you wild. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, you perform I, sometimes. That that would be exactly that era, like yeah. 02 or O one, and um and Tony, Tony Dangerous, Tony D was in the battle as well. Shout out to Tony D. So we really felt like, oh, we're taking over this shit. Like Doc's doing a PA, Revs and T are killing it in the battles battling guys that we were looking up to and we came away from that night going we're the shit mm -hmm. you know you start feeling yourself mm -hmm. so much easier to feel yourself when you got other guys like if you're yeah, in a crew absolutely and that was my dream to just have my own crew because i was in a crew before that and it's just i never felt comfortable in it right. do you know what i mean it was it wasn't formed in the same way right. like um just through f f people that you 
were immediately friends with and the levels of spitting was like it just felt just like yours mm -hmm. but but better <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like oh yeah. man it's perfect yeah um so it was it was kind of born that night but yeah like to go back i think hosting the friday nights at deal real was so much my wheelhouse without even me realizing it you know diffusing aggressive situations or yes. difficult situations I can imagine. Very, again it became very natural to me keeping mm -hmm. things light mm -hmm. so that people could have a good time be aggressive rap has to be aggressive has to be yeah but then you also have to have a line Absolutely. and if you have like a good atmosphere you can have like wild aggression it's like when you <laughs> it's like when you're walking down blackstock road and you see like the North African dudes like screaming at each other. I used to see it when I was a kid. I'd be like, oh my God, there's a fight kicking off. You know, you're like yeah. five or six, you get scared and you get older and you see they're like all bridges. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just yeah, like, it's that's the speed and the aggression and the tone <laughs> of the of the, the the conversation culturally. And hip, hip hop rap is just like that. Right, okay. It's not a softly spoken thing. No, not at all. You not could get all. all up in someone's face and it's great. It adds something. And it's all love. Yeah. And it's like, we all know what it is. Like, have you seen any of um, Ginger J's, uh, the pen game battles? No, I have not. Oh, no. uh, check out, yeah, Ginger, Ginger J, J Francis. Check out his uh, pen game battles that he hosts. Like, he's a hilarious guy. Yeah. But you see those battles, the aggression level is fucking turned up to 11. But because of the atmosphere he creates. It's nothing. It's nothing. Yeah. But some people would watch it and go, you know, like, uh, yeah. like that woman that called in about... Um, <laughs> the performance that well, the famous thing that they sampled on the was it on the Skepta tune? Oh yeah, um, you're talking about the clashes back in the day. No, uh, the, remember the the, the the famous Skepta tune? It sampled that woman who called up the news and was like, 11 hooded black men <laughs> moving very aggressively." I don't pay my <laughs> license fee. Do you remember that? I think she called in about. Wasn't that about the Kanye West thing? When she had maybe it was all Kanye. the grime, she had all the grime MCs. Yeah, yeah, he had all the grime MCs Kanye, for all day. I think yeah. maybe Skepta sampled. That yeah, yeah, because Skepta was like Jamie and all them was on stage with with Kanye that's when he was performing um, at the Brits. Yes, but that's, that's what, what it was. It yeah, yeah, and that's what I mean. Yeah, it's like it's so easily misinterpreted, but when you're within it, it makes total sense. That said, yeah, your responsibility is deeper than you think. Like you need to be able to clock when the line's been crossed Thanks. and to defuse that situation Thanks. because. Mate, shit fucking happens. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's, uh, throughout my, my life in hip hop, especially when I was younger, shit happened way more because, mate, like... Yeah, of course. Who's too stupider than men under 20? Like, <laughs> yeah, 100%, bro. Even dogs are smart. Yeah. Like. <laughs> and you look it's at me. So look, true. look at me. I'm clearly not someone who gets in shit, but I did then. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I got the few scraps. I was the never hard. Like, <laughs> yeah, 100%. It's bro. like, you just, you, how do you think you're in a movie or something? Who do you something? think you're talking to? Is that, that stuff? Yeah. Like, yeah. Just, oh man! Just can't you can't let that slide. All exactly. That nonsense. So of course there is that risk factor, and like deal real, I would have been like twenty one, twenty two. So even that, I was already like that kind of. There was an elder statesman feel to it when you've got kids in there as young as like Reveal was. Do you mm. know what I mean? Mm. There's this 15, 16, mm. 17 year olds. Shit could kick off yeah, quite 100%. quite easily. So I think I honed comic or the skills of a stand-up comedian then without realizing it would ever be useful i think poisonous poets might have been the first rap group in the uk that i felt i mean apart from you had the soul solids and whatnot but they mm. were more they were more garage and whatever but that each individual member had a little name for themselves you know how usually you got some rap groups and it's like you have the stars and you have guys mm. in the back mm. but i was like like i knew about your work i knew about reveals work i knew about tony d's work you know i knew about therapist work you know so it was all like you all had your own solo little projects and you all did your thing that but it, i felt like that buzz came really quickly after like you guys all kind of you said you guys formed i know it was just the four of you at yeah first. it did you're right yeah and it just kind of just took off and you were like radio like choice yeah it's it, true everywhere. when i think about it yeah. it's quite mad um I think part of it is like you were saying, we all four of us had our own things going on. We Not one of us was like, oh God, if Poisonous isn't happening, what am I going to do? True. We all had our own teams. We had our own people. We had our own crews. And on top of that, we represented like three parts of London really clearly. Mm -hmm. do you yeah, know what yeah, so in, in North and West, I was known. In, in, in West, Rez was known. In East, East Tony, Tony and Ferrell wasn't known. Absolutely. So even like therapists who've probably done the least in terms of like high profile stuff, 
like he was the one that introduced me to like Dirty Dugs and yeah. people like that. He showed me what grime was. Right, right. That's when so it didn't even have a name. Wow. That's he also taught me how to rap in that style. I, I didn't know how to do it before right. therapist. So I remember I had a tune on that same Citizen Smith, or was it? No, the second one, one. Second, the sequin, 06, Nothing yeah. to Lose. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, like. The double time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That was so well honed by that point. But yeah. if you trace it back to the first time I would have spat like that, it would have been on a Poisonous record in like 02 before I knew what grime was because Farrah showed me how. Right. That is so interesting. Shout out to, shout out to Poisonous Poets. Shout out to all the members, man. Farrah Piss. Crazy. Uh, um, Reveal, Tony D. You got Man, more. No. You talk about Styler. We'll get to Styler. We'll get to Low Key. Yeah. But um. But yeah. Okay. That's amazing. Then you. Then you. Then you drop Citizen Smith. Mm. That was probably 2004. Oh four. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that's. I think that's when your name was started to bubble a bit more. Obviously, you had. You, you build a little name of yourself already from all the groundwork that you've done. But in terms of. But I don't think you did any videos for Citizen Smith. I think it was only from the document. So. The document, I remember, because I used to, just by the no way. Money, like, no money. Like, I was just so broke. I just, I of course. Even, I can't even imagine, like, putting that together. Was there any song on it? I don't think so. Well, but the, the, import, the, the important thing is that you were doing the important work. Because I know some people will have a video and that will help them. But you were making sure you were doing all the groundwork first before the visuals came out. Does that make sense? So you were yeah, still getting I, your... I don't even think I thought about it with that much maturity. Sure. I think I was just, like, I was just so desperate to get songs out and um just see what happens i see how they're received mm. um and i just I, I really loved that record and and um i think the real sort of impetus for it was probably um the low key tune like just dis yeah. discovering loki getting him on a song so quickly then the next thing i know like it's like joe wiley's playing it it's like you know i was like holy shit loki back then man he had so much energy Oh, he's incredible. He was spitting. He was so spitting. dangerous. Yeah, he was. He was in crazy. In an open mic, it was like unnerving. Like there was, <laughs> it was tense when he when he took to the mic because he was he was so intense. Mm. Mm. And you know, the last time I'd seen anything like that was Reveal. You right. Know, yeah. A couple of years exactly. Ago, like the intensity of him on the mic. Exactly. How much it it felt like it meant. But then, of course, like that day when Loki battled the other Loki, and I bodied remember. him. Yeah. That was the moment I was just like. I need to recruit this kid, like not now, but like yesterday, because you get that thing with rap. It's so competitive. You mm -hmm. just think he's gonna destroy everybody mm -hmm. if he's not on my like. If he's on my team, then at least like yeah, exactly. We've got the destroyer of everybody. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Even if I'm I shit, <laughs> even if I turn shit tomorrow, it's like yeah, but we got this guy. It's like you know when Fat Joe is like you listen to Fat Joe and you're like, I feel like Fat Joe's getting like progressively worse over time <laughs> and then he, he finds big pun it's like well it doesn't matter now. no it doesn't it doesn't matter because we've maybe. we just got a nuclear weapon <laughs> like so what you what you gotta say it's a good that's you a good gonna analogy. say i'm shit yeah give it a bash man i'll that's... i'll press the red button and then and then even when he started recruiting pun he started getting better as absolutely yeah, he did so he it was it was good for him yeah uh let's talk about your little short stint at jump off you were a battle battle rap champion, right? Before Pro Green took over. Yeah, three took times. Over, yeah. yeah, three times. What was the time there? Because I remember, but I used to go to Jump Off, but I think I came in the latter stages. I, I wasn't. Yeah, I mean, I'm so old school. The first Jump Off I entered was underneath Yo Sushi on Poland Street. Wow, wow. Some little, like wow. little event space. You could see the sushi going around on the little track thing. It's like it's weird, um, but I did well, and then it moved to. The Swiss Center, right, which is now the M and M Museum. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, and then it became a bit more serious, and that's where I had probably the best battle I ever had against. It was a guy called Rocky. Okay. And by that stage, I got quite used to people, the things that people would cuss me about, and because it was improvised, then it was like old school freestyle. Because you kind of knew people would come with the same cliches. But so your I style came was ready for but, it. but also your style was different. You gotta give yourself like, hundred percent. Like, like, yeah, like you would kind of self-deprecate a bit. Yeah, yeah. I joke about it because yeah. I was just like, well, what I'm gonna say? I'm not gonna say I'm gonna bang you up. It's not gonna happen. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I'm gonna cuss your mom. I'm gonna talk about the things that you're gonna cuss me about. Um, and it worked, man. Yeah, I mean, I remember. I can't even remember how the bar went, but I remember the moment I won that battle, and, and I think it was my second um, title. Because he was gunning me for being mixed race, for being light skin, you know, and all this shit, and it was yeah. like constant. And that's obviously that you can get a good couple barbs in on that. Yeah, 
very good and i like i love it like i don't mind i think like the just the right level of racism is really funny <laughs> it's so delicate you gotta know you gotta know what the point is to just go now you cross the line <laughs> I find like just the right, just the sprinkle, you know, like Dave Chappelle is. The racism is just yeah. perfect. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But if you do it too often, diminishing returns, less funny, and people get a bit like, all right, yeah, we get it. She's fat or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. Like, how many times are you going to say it? Exactly. So I kind of knew like that was hitting in the face. And then I, like, I just went for him in the third round. I felt like I had him on the ropes. And then at the last bar, just before I knew that the, the, the gong was going to go, I said something about, um, how the most embarrassing part of this is that I didn't, I merged with my white half. <laughs> oh, that is sick. That is sick. That is sick. I, I can't remember how it went, but like, that was it. Like, yeah. the roof came yeah, off. Yeah, I, yeah, I like, can imagine. Game over. That's hilarious. Game over. And then, um, I, you know what? It's funny. I've got uh, loads of VHS tapes of, um, I used to be called Channel You religiously. Oh, man, yeah. So we got, I've got Love You the Light Right Way. Oh, my God. I need to, I need to dig these tapes out. And you also had, um, Nothing, you said nothing to lose, wasn't it? That's that mm. was a double. Yeah, you had a video for that as well, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was um, that was shot by Luke Biggins. Rest Sick. in peace. He did he did a lot of uh, uh, rap videos for um, for just like us guys who had like no money. I can't remember how much you had to scramble together. Right. I feel like it was maybe like five hundred pounds or something really? like that. I can't remember. Some of those videos look decent though, because obviously with, with, at but that time, at time you, you were allowed a, to get away with yeah, like, yeah. budget stuff. You but know? even at that time, that was a lot of money. Yeah, of course. That's a lot 100%. of money to try and get together. Um, I really remember that and you just like the, the pressure that you felt on it. But yeah, that Love Me The Right Way, there's a little kid in it yeah. playing the young me. Yeah. That's my couson, okay. Jesse, and he was at, um, he was at the launch. The oh, other was night. he? Yeah, yeah. Oh, shout out to Big Jesse, ass yeah. man now. We're going to talk about the new album and the launch um, too. Yeah, man. Uh, the Channel U, I never had it, but you know who was big on Channel U was my brother. Like his video did the rounds. Yes, like, it did. Yes, it a lot did. of time, even now, like people of a certain age, probably your age actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Would say, oh, your brother is your brother Luke's guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Channel U, bro. Channel U. I think it was maybe the Raise Up. He had a couple. Yeah, songs Raise Up did really well. Yeah, that did. That got playlisted and all that stuff. Yeah, man. That's crazy. Crazy times back then, man. And. um but I was I was reflective. The reason I brought those songs up because even with those projects, you've always been because we're gonna go into your new project very shortly. But you've always kind of been a bit, as much as you are a hard rapper and you you can spit bars and you can battle rap and you can do a little bit of comedy. You've also been very conscious as well. So there's been stuff that you talked about. I remember there was some bar you had about you know London Eye being an eyesore, and do <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like just yeah. always like addressing government and what they're not doing. For their people, um, and and I think that you really hit home with that in this new release, um, do more. Do you think? Because I, I was you... I was worried. I was actually really worried that it wasn't uh, socially aware enough. You don't think? What, I think so. I think the bar that you, you were being very. Because I think that's always been like a thing in my music. Mm. I don't think it's been the overriding thing. No, ever. it hasn't. It's, no, it hasn't. My music's always mostly been just fun. Mm. But I don't think there's a release that's gone by where I haven't at least touched on it in some way, shape, or form. I just think. Going overboard, it's like I should probably just be a, an activist or know my shit yeah. properly, like like yeah. like Loki. Yeah, do you mean Lo Loki yeah. doesn't just rap about it; he no, lives it. He lives it, man. And I remember thinking, even when I was young, it's like, what's worse? Yeah, out of the two types of fake rapper that exist, is like, is it worse to say on a track you're like? <laughs> you're shanking this man you've done this you did a stretch in jail you never went in jail you said you were poor you were never poor like is, is it worse saying that stuff and not doing it mm -hmm. or is it worse saying like save the world shit and, and not, not doing it, it? Yeah, exactly. and I thought actually that's worse yeah, it probably is actually. that's worse because yeah. at least this guy isn't killing anybody yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's lying yeah. about it but at least he's not actually doing it yeah, yeah, yeah. you're lying about it and you're not even doing yeah. anything with your life so I think a lot of it came from youth work because like when I I did a BTEC level three in youth management and opened my own club. Um, and, uh, well, I didn't, I, actually, I didn't open my own club. It already existed, but I had the qualifications to manage it. Right. Um, and it was started by one woman out of a broom cupboard in a school. <laughs> and she was helping, like, opposite the school, there's like a series of um, hotels that were paid for by the home office that were, like, disgusting, right. that housed um, newly arrived asylum seekers. Okay. And the kids of those families went to this school and obviously it created havoc because you've suddenly got like tr 
traumatized kids, kids traumatized by wars and stuff like that, can't speak a word of English, mixed in with these other kids and the tensions between the parents and difficulties with teachers and stuff like that. And this charity was set up to support specifically those kids, right? right. So I came in as a as a as a youth worker, like to manage after school activities for these kids, but it quickly turned into like their parents would come with a, like a translator or with, or with their fucking kids who'd learn how to speak English and go, this is what's happening for me. Do you know what I mean? Like my dad's on the, um, my husband's on the run from the secret police in Tehran or like um, I'm being uh, uh, harassed by the police here or, you know, the situation at the hotel, there's like, you know, people that work there committing atrocities against us, like, you know, it would be an abuse, shit like that housing problems, all this stuff. I was experiencing it every day mm. and then <laughs> going to Deal Real on Friday and being like the host with the most. So when I wrote songs, I think I always felt like at least one of these has to not be about how good I am at rapping. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, bro. But I was also, I was conscious from the start of like, do you want to be too preachy? Yeah. No, yeah, I, I don't, you, have, you never was though. You've never been preachy. I think even within those songs, it's like, where's the sort of tongue in cheek element or the, or the element of like, this is serious and here's what I feel I can do about it, but here's my limit. Like at the end of the day, I'm a rapper. Yeah, absolutely. But you, you I think you balanced all that well though. All, I, I all those so. elements, you I know, you so. definitely did. Let's talk about, I guess you, you got to a stage in rap where I've, I, I heard you say this. This mm. is not me. I heard you say this and I think we had a conversation about this before. But you said you came to a stage in your life where you're probably going to do one last album, call it a day. 100%. And then randomly, uh, you got somebody, a friend of yours called you about doing some sort of gig with One Extra, like comedy, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, yeah. And then that led on to meeting Lenny Henry? Absolutely, yeah. That was that was the way it went. So I'd, I'd met him while I was still deeply immersed in like serious rap and youth work and that was my life. Mm. And One Extra was still pretty young. And yeah. I had a relationship with them because yeah, 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 even yeah. then I was doing like links, like when it first started, like coming up, the, there's this show, that show. Mm -hmm. I went on it, appeared on there a few times, like doing freestyles and yeah, and you all see that the West, stuff. Westwood and yeah, Westwood all that shit. Yeah. And um, so I had a bit of a relationship with him. But this guy was doing like a comedy show, either on Radio One or One Extra or both. I can't remember. And he wanted like spoof rap sort right. of jingle things on there. And I was so such a serious young guy. I was like, I'll do it, but as long as it's not my voice, someone else to inform it. And don't t say who has written it <laughs> or anything like so that. Wild. Do you know what I mean? I can't imagine that. I can't. I can't imagine that. But yeah, see whereas, how things panned out. Whereas now so. with the Snoop Dogg, when it's like it's embargoed and I wasn't allowed to say anything for a year, I was chumping at the bit <laughs> to tell the world, like, I wrote this shit. I wrote this shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But back then it was like I don't want anyone to picture me as a clown or a sellout. Like how how immature is that? Like to get a little gig like that on one extra, which is like immersed in hip hop culture anyway, yeah. to feel like that's sellout. Like that's yeah, how yeah. underground backpacky I was, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, so like, didn't think anything of it. It was like two years later when like you say, I was, I was done with rap. I just couldn't work out how to make a living from it. I had a daughter, you know, yeah. like it just, shit just wasn't a game anymore. Of course. Do you know what I mean? It was, two, it was 07, so my daughter was like a year and a half old coming up to two years old and I was just like yeah I'm done and he called me again but he'd moved into writing straight up sitcom comedy and he was writing a thing for Lenny Henry Amazing. and that was it that was my that was my transition into comedy it started there I'd, I'd never finished the album it is actually kind of done but it's not like mixed and mastered I would love to hear that it's called man. Another Way and it's all live instrumentation it's just totally different to anything I've ever done Sick. because I'd been touring with Mark Ronson with a yes. live band doing like live hip hop and I found it really inspirational. Right. The weird thing about that job, that tour, which is the only time I ever made money off rap, by the way, was that when it came to an end, it was a it was a real come down. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like a real come down. Like going back to like you know, I took everything I, I, I had a bit of disdain for everything. I can Do you know what I mean? That. Like hosting little nights at the O bar in Camden and like mm. battles, you know, little open uh, a, ciphers mm. trying to put a song out no one cares i was a bit like I just, it's this is shit yeah. like i've just been on a tour where like these guys are making millions of pounds the hundreds of thousands of fans yeah the only reason i was on that tour is because ghostface wouldn't do it so i was doing ghostface i remember that i was doing Ghostface. you know what i actually remember that this is crazy you just reminded me 
I remember that. I remember you were filling in for him because he wouldn't do the. It yeah, was yeah. for Uwe. No, yeah, 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 Uwe. Uwe. Yeah. So I did and Ghostface, do... and there was a version of that song that has Saigon on it. So I had to do yeah, Saigon's verse. Saigon's verse. Saigon's verse and Ghostface's verse. What? I didn't I... do it in American. I just no. did it in my voice. <laughs> I but know. actually, like when I did it, I was like, you know, Saigon's a problem, bro. Yeah, he's sick. Isn't that it? guy can flow. Yeah, I was like, crazy. I actually love doing that Saigon verse. But why do I remember that? Like, because like, you said there's a tour, but I felt like I might have actually seen that. The first time we did it was at Fabric. It's prob- it was probably that. And know? it was me, Mark, I think Daniel Merriweather, Amy Winehouse. I can't remember, man. Did, did we have Lily Allen for that one? Don't think so. Was it ever televised? No, no, no. This is well, literally just live. This is just live stuff. We, we did a couple clubs in, in London. But I, was mainly it was like, I was always out then. It was so big venues. I, I probably did see that myself. It's big venues and festivals. It might have been a festival. It's um, interesting. So right, it was a yeah. funny job. But when I finished it, yeah, I had that arrogant thing of like, yeah, but it's underground rap thing. And also by that stage, Grime actually had become a thing. That's right. And they, those guys, I don't care what anybody says, they showed us how to do business. 1,000. They showed us what we should be doing. Like everybody, every UK rapper, which is what I would class myself as, that feel, feels like they're uh, not the success they should have been or it didn't, their songs didn't, didn't get as much attention. And they always say the industry wasn't there for us. Mm-hmm. It, there was no uh, infrastructure. But there was right. no infrastructure for them either. Like they no, made it happen. They were, they were a community though. They were together. They were together. They we were not together. together. That, we was all, the, that was the difference. They were, we, we were not a union no, of any kind. Not at all. And the other advantage that they had, to be fair to UK rap, is that in a way, like the worlds of garage and the worlds of jungle, like that that culture and that community as well, sort of provided a bit more of a very homegrown bedrock for grime to exist. Absolutely. Whereas we were a, 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 a castle made like made of sand, like you know, we were built on a shaky foundation because we're. We're inspired ultimately by America. Yeah, yeah. I actually 100% believe we're not anymore. It is like now it's just so British. It's just the yeah. British version of rap. Yeah. That's all it is. That's right. I don't think anyone's trying to sound like them anymore. Like that's all gone. Yeah. And you could also argue that now like half of grime is just rap anyway. Like Absolutely. Um, and some of which is directly inspired by American sounds. So it's, it's all like yep. mixed up it's and all, everything it's now. Messed, yeah, it's but all I, one melting pot now. I guess the ultimate point is that that thing of like, we had no chance. I mm. kind of buy it, but not 100%. Because I've stopped, I've stopped if we for played excuses, it differently. 100%. I stopped looking if it's for excuses for things that didn't go my way a long mm. time ago. I know I could have worked harder. It's as simple as that. 100%. Like, did we that. really, really believe? It's like when you're watching football, yeah? And it's a smaller team against a bigger team. And it ends 2-0 to the bigger team. They didn't do amazingly. You'll hear the commentator say they didn't really get out of third gear. But it's mainly because the smaller team genuinely, deep, deep down in them, deep, they would never say it, but they didn't believe they were going to win. That's it. That's it. No, that's facts. That's facts. Bro. That's, that is a great analogy. And I think deep, deep down, if if we were really, we wouldn't say it to anybody else. We wouldn't even say it out loud. But looking in the mirror, so knew. deep down, do I really believe? That's right. That like Citizen Smith Volume One is gonna be like on a mixtape level with whatever that that like DJ Clue that mm. year. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Like. Yeah. Yeah. What have you done to make that happen? To yeah. manifest that? Mm. Mm. And it was a great lesson for me because. I didn't. I wasn't working full time. I did. I didn't take that risk. If I truly believed it was possible, I would have yeah. taken the risk. Yeah. And that's why it was a much easier decision in February two thousand and eight to quit my job right. and go. Let's see where this comedy thing takes me because awesome. it felt like a second chance, a second bite of the apple. Well, let, let's talk about the, the the moment I I feel changed your life forever, which is when you appeared on the Russell Howard show. Yeah, hundred percent. Watershed moment. Yeah. I mean, that was a great stand-up segment. Till this day, I watched it the other day while I was preparing for this interview and I was cracking up because obviously the the famous How to Make a Proper Tea uh, rap, you know. Still the biggest song I've ever written. (laughs) Technically, the first Just Eat advert is the biggest song I've ever written. Yeah, yeah, which we'll talk about. But it's really, it's really proper tea because it's so British. Yeah. And... It's clever. No, but can I just say... 
don't do you th like very clever very you 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 worked it out man like honestly like, i i felt yeah, like i, just, I, I felt just, like just, I, just, I couldn't disagree more but continue no 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 honestly no, honest, no, that it's a fact it's a fact you worked it out it was like you i think with all your the the the, the steps that you've taken with the, all the rap and everything that you've learned from doing rap and failing and getting up and doing mm. it again and and then you were just into this new world of okay maybe i can do comedy let's give it a go i do actually have a sense of humor i am actually, i am quite funny but you also figured out this is what and it needs to be done for, <laughs> for me to get the attention that i deserve I did, oh yeah i just couldn't disagree more you it's smashed not, it bro it's not the way i thought about it so like at the time i'm a job in stand-ups it's 2012. i'm working every night mm. I would do sometimes 13 gigs in a week, right? In a week. Wow. That's so that's crazy. like doubling up on Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, crazy. Sundays, sometimes tripling on a Saturday or a Friday. Wow. So, you know, on my bicycle ride to uh, an opener in South, a middle in Central, a closer in North, do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, like, bro, I was grinding. <laughs> and like, when you're in those gigs and there's so much pressure on each gig, you just can't be shit. It really reminded me of battling like the first time I just got laughed off or whatever or booed off or whatever, like going home thinking that can never happen, happen again. again. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm not that guy. Like yeah. that's not happening to me twice. It mm. happened to me once, mm. but it's not happening to me twice. Mm. Mm. That's why I m made it so quickly in comedy because it became clear to promoters that Doc doesn't die. He might have a, a quiet night, but he doesn't die. Yeah. You know, which is it's actually not true, of course, but um, my stats were crazy. Do you know what I mean? In terms of like killing no, it. Definitely. So it became very uh, uh, reliable for promoters because then it makes their night look good, sells tickets, blah, blah, blah. So I'm doing that all the time. And like I say, the pressure means can't be shit, can't be shit, can't be shit. And then you create 20 minutes that is bulletproof, but you do it so often that people start to know it. So you've got to create a new 20 minutes, but it takes fucking ages. Mm. So you've got to weave in bits. You can't write a whole new 20 minutes. That could take a year right. to, to perfect it, right, right. not to write it. You can funny. write an hour of comedy in an hour, but it's not gonna be good. Yeah, <laughs> to actually perfect To perfect it. it so that 20 minutes, even every breath is is funny and you're getting, you know, multiple laughs per minute. Mm. Mm. Takes, takes a long time to, to and so to, weave into new bits that may or may not work is constantly terrifying mm -hmm. so i knew that i had russell howard coming up and i knew that i had bits from the circuit that were absolutely bulletproof that i would use and then i'd ha also have to burn them because i knew it was high profile right um and i didn't particularly want to risk doing something new that people didn't know i was doing a voiceover in a place in soho and this woman got tea and coffee for everyone and she came in uh and she goes she gave me mine she goes um you know what i've 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 just left it all for you to do because you know you never know like even though you told me how you want it like <laughs> pe how people like their tea it's it's like it's a serious thing and i was like yeah you're right and she goes i swear like there could be a civil war in this country about how people do or don't like their tea and then she just went off you know, it's just serving tea in a in a studio. And you were like, Ding. and straight away I was like, <laughs> a civil war. Like that's how passionate people are. Because I don't really give a shit about tea. No, <laughs> I don't really drink it. Exactly. I mean, I love tea. Like, but I, don't I have get a cup of tea, much. like yeah, yeah, I don't in the morning, much. like yeah. on certain days. Yeah. But, like if it's like summer, I'm not waking up and having a cup of tea. Or people do have tea. Like motherfuckers drink tea like all day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd, I'd no, just be sweating here, if I did that. Like, <laughs> And dehydrated, like I, I'm not really big on like hot drinks. Anyway, <laughs> that's besides the point. <laughs> so I go home, and I was just in the back or oh, garden of my old my old flat in um, in Dalston, and I wrote it in less than fifteen minutes, and I, on a piece of paper. And I was in Brighton at the Comedia that night, which is no, was it Brighton or was it Bath? I think it was Brighton, um, and it's like a great venue for comedy. It's quite big and get big laughs in there if you do well. And I was doubling and in the second, the late night show, I thought, fuck it, I'm gonna do it. But I had to read it from the piece of paper. Yeah. And I said to them, look, I'm doing this Russell Howe thing, is it cool? And I did it. And when I say it killed, I don't think I've ever read anything from a piece of paper and got a response like that. Amazing. So when I went to Russell's, I like he, he knocked on the door of the dressing room 
I said, I'm going to do all this shit. Like, like Slang 101 was like my closer on the circuit. Um, I think I did Everybody's Racist. That yeah. always just killed it. Yeah. I was like, I think I'm actually going to close with this new thing that I wrote. I've been memorizing it today. And he was like, they're new on a TV show. I was like, no, I just have a feeling about it. And I wrapped it to him. He goes, bro, if you don't do that, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> I love And that. that gave me the confidence. And I was like, I'm going to do it. And it fucking killed. Now you smashed it. You know what's funny about that video that nobody knows? Um, I, the Slang 101 thing I always did as a, as a closer, right? But I just stopped doing it because um, this older comic called Mickey, he was like in his 50s. I remember we were doing overseas gigs and he goes, he saw me for the first time and he, he saw the Slang 101. He goes, that's going to be the first thing you stop doing. And I was like, bro, like, yeah. It's my closer, like, yeah, well, kills that. every night. Yeah. You guys are just telling you, like, prop shit. Like, once you get into doing this job every single night, just believe me, that'll be the first thing you lose. I'm supposed to be going, these old guys, man. Yeah. Like, I'm the new yeah. shit in comedy, Try, man. try to steal I'm your like shy. The hot, I'm what the is, hottest thing. What does he think he is? On the come up in the UK right now, you know. How does he know? Honestly, within a couple of months, I was like, he was so right. Like, you're late for the gig. You haven't sorted the cards from the night before. You left the card at home. You're on stage. You can't open the fucking thing to get the cards out. He was so right. He was so right. So I, I was certain I was going to put it to bed that night. I was going to, this was the last time I'd ever do it. But the cards that I had from the circuit had to have beer stains and tea shit on them. Right. So I had to get them like redone real quick on that day, like coloring in the words and shit. And I was obviously so nervous. And I actually wrote, I got a, a translation wrong on the card. Right. And I didn't realize until I was in the dressing room, we're about to go on. I was like, fuck, like I put peak as being something good. And I just yeah, didn't, peak. I yeah, just yeah. didn't, no, I was so nervous. I was just like, I don't know how I can improvise around this because it's so clear on the sign. Right. So I just thought, you know what, just do it. And then you can think like, well, the whole thing is like, I'm a bit of an idiot, so it'll be fine. But it always bugs me. Like, <laughs> if I just used the original ones, it would have been fine. That is but so I overthought it and I fucked it. I did peak as good. And I was like, But oh. nobody would know. No one know. But That's the a... man them, the yeah, man them. Yeah, yeah, they'd be like, excuse me. Oh, and that, did, that did, did you get, did you yeah, get yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. And I was like, I knew this would happen. I had to explain myself. I was like, it's so annoying that I got that bit wrong. But because I'm a perfectionist in it, yeah. same, same as you, yeah. same as a lot of people yeah, in this game. Yeah, it'll, it'll get to you. It'll but yeah, you. 100% you're right. My life changed after that day. What do you prefer? Everybody's racist or proper or proper tea? Everybody's racist. Me too. It's so stupid. The Dow, was it the Dalsation the Dow line? Bro, like this. That's classic, bro. This. There was a young black dude who messaged me a couple years ago, right, on Insta. And he goes, uh, hey, man, like, I'm a big fan. I'm a, I'm a up-and-coming film director. I'm, I'm, tw I'm 24, 23. Um, you know, I've, 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 I've studied all your works. Great, blah, blah, blah. So it gives me lots of problems. Like, oh, this is nice. Nice coming from a next generation mm -hmm. youngsters. Mm -hmm. And he goes, um, yeah, just, you know, the everybody's racist thing. I just um, wonder if you know, because it was such a different time in 2012 that you maybe look back on it and, and, and regret some of the language you used. Oh, wow. Um, you know, knowing that the respect that we need to have for all differences, you know, be they gay, straight, black, white, you know, it's it's a different time. And you ever like worry that you'd be considered a dinosaur with this kind of language? And then he said, and would you consider being as talented, as funny as you are, like reworking it for my generation uh uh love and respect blah 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 and i just texted him back fuck off <laughs> <laughs> i wasn't expecting that no absolutely what the hell did he Bro. not did he not get did he not get the joke I was like, he clearly didn't get the joke. First, you know when you suddenly think, oh my god, I've offended someone. Bro. You get that slightly cold feeling, and then I thought about it, and I was no, like, no, bro, wait a minute, that's ridiculous. And then, like I say, it was ten years later, so I was like, shit, maybe I was a bit insensitive, no and way. I watched it back, and I was like, no way, no, the whole thing. Oh my what, god, you said, did you not say the cars? You said the cars <laughs> racist. You said the cars. I said the queue is said, racist. Yeah, exactly. Like that's it's ridiculous, bro. It's a, it's the most ridiculous, simple layer of satire. You know, absolutely. It's, it's not even about racism. Really. No, it's, it's about Blaming. myself and my culture. Like my friends, and I include myself in this, 
who have made excuses for ourselves yeah, yeah. on why shit's yeah. not happening in our yeah, lives. Yeah, hundred percent. It's a joke about me and my friends. Yeah, it's bla- and it's blatant. It's yeah. so blatant. And it's, and it's not masked up. No. Like, so I was a bit like, no way. And that's why I thought I could go, well, wow, I'm really sorry to hear about this, but actually I think it stands up and it's funny and I, could, I feel like I can defend it. I understand your point. I just thought, nah, nah fuck nah, off. I, I told, you I don't get it, agree. bro. That was the best way to respond to that. <laughs> that. And you know what? It's so funny. That's the thing me and my friends used to say back then in like uni days. Uh, like, Oh, that's racist. Like, I'll be like, oh, what are you doing tomorrow? Oh, I can't. Uh, are, you, are you free? <laughs> no, I'm taking care of the kids. I'll I say racist. Yeah, like, yeah, that's yeah, the humor. Yeah, that's yeah, the, yeah. That, I love that. Um, I used to always do it about like just items. You yeah. Know what I mean, when someone would say, like, I still do it to my wife now, you know, because she's white. And she, you know what I mean? If she says, um, you know, I have the white one. I always do it. Like, do you know what I mean? I just, I can't help myself. But it's I'm the same. I've been doing it since I was a little kid. 100%. And you should never. Be sorry for that. People, people are <laughs> insane. Um, you had a, 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 a bit of a time with Ricky Gervais. Yeah. You, yeah. Uh, you guys worked on a few things together. You were in the Office movie. Mm-hmm. And you had the Christmas number one. Am I right in saying it was a Christmas? Am I wrong about that? It wasn't a Christmas I, number one. I would have remembered if I had a Christmas okay, number one. Okay, my bad. That would be my bad. I think I, in my head it was a Christmas number one. But you I did... feel like that's the pinnacle for a British... <laughs> Like when you're a national treasure now. I'm just making things up, but it was um, it was like red 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 nose day, right? Yeah. Yes, that's what, that's what it was. Wow, the way I mistook that for Christmas number one is actually. I can crazy. see why though, because it's sort of it's the same sort of wheelhouse, isn't it's it? It's around like, the same time, and yeah, it's one of those things where it's that level of profile that you sort of put it in the same area as as last Christmas by yeah. Wham. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's just like But that done really well. You had it like did a, amazingly. a lot of your comedy songs like kick and kick and kick you in the balls and run away. Like you had a you had a a, a run where it, oh, 100%. where it was, was like, like you were like our version of Lonely Island. Yeah. Our version of um Flight of the Concords. Yeah, yeah, yeah 100%. And I was, it was and I was, Flight of the Concords actually. Flight uh, no, Concours. I was inspired by their radio show quite okay. heavily. Me okay. me and my producer who made all the um rap all the comedy rap songs mickey's we were listening to the radio show but so it's before the tv show right but we listened to the radio show ah, which okay. was jokes and like the songs i'd play in the songs we'd be pissing okay, ourselves okay, so it was okay. inspired by that um i think it was before lonely island though. i think it was before lonely island definitely um, okay yeah, yeah. and then I, I, but what was so great because that was when you then then you really started transitioning to tv Mm. And you were kind of everywhere. Like I know you've done a lot of. You said you've done a lot of voiceover work, but you also uh, did a show called The Four O'clock Club. And a lot of kids in a certain generation who I may have met as they got an older through work or whatnot, and they found out that me and you were friends. They were they oh you know those are my best fans. It's crazy. Bar none. It's crazy. They're my best fans. And Luke Skies was involved in that as well. Your brother was involved. Yeah, in he that. took over from me. So I'd written him into the show as like a famous rapper. Okay. So it's quite a handy tool to have, like, because you can have kids aspiring to things like within the show, and it it raises the stakes. Right. So he was this famous rapper called B Mode. Um. Uh. But yeah, when it came to the second series, and I knew I had to leave, I couldn't be on the show because I was starting to do other TV, and yes. I had a chance to do some serious acting. I was really excited. Um. I didn't want to stop writing it though. So I stayed writing for four years and then even that Amazing. became too much. Right. And so, you know, people go, oh, nepotism. You know, that guy's just that guy's son. Mate, I love nepotism. I, I, I think, I, you know, <laughs> I think if you come from money, it's different because it feels like, oh, you're taking the piss. Like yeah. you're already rich. Yeah. Your, your dad was already rich and now you're putting your son on. He's already, he doesn't even need to do mm, it. Mm, mm. But I think if you don't come from money, help you, it's help like, you out, man. James Gunn does it with his brother. But the main thing is, I knew he could do it. Yeah, yeah. Because like, if if it was if it was one of those situations, which I think must be horrible, if you and your brothers both rap and your brother is whack, I genuinely <laughs> I think that'd be horrible. Yeah, imagine, how do you address it? I'm trying to think of like that'd be like a Nas nightmare. And jungle. Oh. Yeah, oi, that's. I mean, that's not far <laughs> off. You know, just say it. Sorry, don't come for me, guys. <laughs> we're, we're gonna see Nas soon. Oh yeah, 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 of course. Don't come for me, Lars. If you see, yeah, me. no, for real. But like, <laughs> it would be mad awkward. But I just knew he could do it, mm. um, and I knew because obviously with your brothers you have such a a, a special sense of humor. Yeah, that you don't have with anybody else. Yeah, of course. Like of you course. can you can look at your brother and you, know, you sort of know Absolutely. what the what the joke is. It's like telekinesis, man. Yeah. Only you two in the room will get it. Yeah, yeah. He, or like he's the only other person in my whole life who like. 
I kind of even know what he's going to say right, before, before he, he says it. it. I might not know the, all the ins and outs of it, but the way he's approached me, the body language, I kind of know what he's about to say. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, and vice versa. So we have that. So I just thought it's the smoothest way of leaving the show. We had to do like official, you know, like BBC had to be like, yeah. we have to show due diligence and speak to a couple of other people. But right. as, as a producer on it, I was just like, yeah, bias him. So what what prompted you to make that show? Was that because of the oh, youth work? Yeah, I was just the say original that. Was version of Four O'clock Club was called Dream Scheme. It was right. the first thing I ever tried to write as a script. Amazing. And I wrote a whole episode, and again, it was inspired by Flight of the Concords. I was like, a comedy show. Uh, I think originally I was thinking it uh, not even for kids, like for just for people my age, like a comedy show about like this youth worker who smokes weed, is a shit youth worker. He's like way more childish than all the teenagers he works with. Mm. Mm. And there's one teenager in the youth club who's way smarter than any adult. Right. So you've got a sort of Homer Simpson figure and a Bart Simpson figure. <laughs> okay. And that was the original concept. And then they both wanted to be rappers, but the youth workers like washed up and the kid's like 16. So he could be the next big thing. Mm. And there's a rivalry that uh, comes between them. And every now and again, you see their innermost thoughts in rap form. Mm -hmm. Same as Flight of the, Flight of the Concords. Mm -hmm. And I showed it to this guy that I knew from the Lenny Henry stuff. And he said, oh, this should be a kid's show. And I was like, what? He goes, no, seriously, like imagine it this way. And he goes, I know someone who works at CBBC. I was like, cool, can you show it to them? And, and he showed it to this woman who worked there. And she was like, this is actually- Really good. This is actually really good. You yeah, should man. do, you should, do something about it. And I was like, but what do I do? And she was like, well, you create like a pitch and, and I'll get it to the um, commissioner. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, fuck, how do you do that? And she was like, well, you, you know, write a PDF, do like what it's all about, have some photos in a document and all of that. And it just sounded like homework. <laughs> and I was just like, Phew. that's the thing. And then he's got to read it. I was just like, that's that just sounds so boring. And she was like, well, the other option is you could just, film one song that sort of it describes it somehow. Okay. Do the pitch as a, a funny rap. And that works. I was like, dude, that's actually a great idea. So we sh we shot, first and foremost, I got a kid from my youth club who's just funny as fuck. He's called Amin. Amin El Sarabi from Sudan. He was just so naturally funny. He'd never acted before. He never rapped before. But I just taught him. And we shot a little thing in school um, with me, because that was the other thing this woman said, it should be, do it set in a school because more people understand what a school is in a youth club, just for this and then we'll talk. I was like, okay, cool. So we did shot a thing with me as a teacher and he's a kid, he's in trouble. And I, mate, you're always in a situation, you're always like fucking up my shit, you know, based not obviously not in those words, but like you're always giving me stress. And then in the midst of it, he seeks into, oh, this teacher is just the most annoying guy and he thinks he's a bad man kind of thing. And then I see into this kid's like putting my job at risk, blah, blah, blah. And that's it, three minutes. And I was like, how do we get it to him? She goes, well, we can give it to the receptionist at the CBBC. And I was like, yeah, but then how do I know he's going to take the time to watch it? I was just like, how, I want to make an impact. Mm. And I felt like we had a little thing that would. I was like, mm, I need something that's really gonna get his attention. So he'll definitely watch it. And I thought, again, just use the power of rap. So I wrote a rap that explained what the show is. I've got this somewhere on my laptop um, in a cheeky way, just like pitching it, but in a funny rap. And then when we gave the other DVD that we made to the receptionist, I asked her, When's, is he, does he go on any meetings or is he ever away from the office? She goes, oh, they're moving CBBC to Manchester. So actually he's in Manchester like a lot. He'd be there for like two weeks next week kind of thing. And I said to her, here's my idea. I've written this rap that pitches the series to him, right? Directly to him. But I'm gonna, I wanna film it in his office when he's not here. She was like, oh, I don't, I don't know if we can. I was like, literally, it would just be me and this woman, she's gonna do camera. Just us. We'll be in, the, the song's a minute long. We go in a minute, yeah. shoot it. We're not doing mad angles. Yeah. Just shoot it like that. Burn the DVD and I'll give it to you. When he comes back, you give it to him. She was like, all right. 
So like a couple of days later, we went into his office when he was away, got the beat playing, I rapped to camera, but I just fucked with his whole office. I was like on his desk, jumping on the sofa. <laughs> And like piles of papers. I brought like stacks of papers and I just dashed them all over the room. And the reception's just like I just fucked up the whole I was like, jumping all over the place. I had my you feet You are a rapper. I had my feet up on his <laughs> desk like this. I was explaining this the, the thing to him like this. Rah, 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 rah. This is like you have to commission it. And then it tidied everything up, it came out, I like went went home, like burnt, like just did the quick edit, burnt it on the CD, brought it back to her. And then a couple of weeks later, my phone rang and it was the commissioner and he goes, you're a ballsy prick for doing that. But just break it. How do you see this thing developing? Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, well, have you watched, we got this other little five minute thing. And he's like, let me watch that. And he's like, oh, I get it. I get it. And they commissioned 13 episodes. CBBC moved up to Manchester and they moved me up to Manchester, got me an apartment. And it's like, when I got there, I was like, what do I do now? How do I write like 13 of these? But they brought in uh, like staff the writers staff team, and we had yeah. a writing team. Yeah, yeah. That's incredible. And it just dog. became that, the, that the biggest incredible. hit CBBC had had since um, uh, Tracy Beaker. Fuck, man. That's Crazy. incredible, bro. And that, that really did sort of solidify my, posi solidify my position as somebody who could come up with ideas that would reach out of just as like a small yeah. demographic you, you come from a family of writers your sister's a writer mm. Sadie Smith I, mm. in fact I've got a picture I was going to show you actually I was on the tube the other day and there was a woman reading the Sadie Smith oh, I love it when that happens so I took a snap so I'll, I'll send it to you so tempting for me to say something but it's just like well, what would I say it'd be weird <laughs> Imagine if I said something. Hey, that's my friend's sister. <laughs> hey, I've got I, really... and I know, I know, Doc Brown. Do you know Doc Brown? I know you're really interested in your book, but I've got a really tenuous link for you. That's... <laughs> and I've never met you before, and we're on a silent tube. You're gonna love this. Um, you ever thought about working with her and writing something with her? Yes and no, because it's like actually, obviously, I've done quite a bit of work with my brother in the past, but it's 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 really hard to do in-depth, boring work with a very close friend or, or family member. Fair enough. Like I said right at the top of this interview, the easiest thing is to do fun work with your friends or family members. Like I agree with that. Stuff that's really granular, like script writing, stuff that's really slow. Like say me and her adopted, adopted, <laughs> adapted a novel together. Mm -hmm. That could be like a couple years work. Yeah. I think you, you've got to be really zen with each other. Me and her are, to be fair, I think we've only had two arguments in our whole lives. I love that. But I'd have to know like the pace and everything, like who, the the balance and all of that you gotta get that right. Yeah, if you're yeah. doing something in depth with somebody, and you work at an alarmingly fast play, pace, but they're amazing, but they work at an alarmingly slow pace, that can be really yeah, difficult you can, to. You could clash heads and. Do you know, I've always been fast. Mm. Yeah, for better are, or bro, for worse. Crazy. I sent you a I sent you a song. And you did that in the day and sent it back. On yeah. Because I always think like, while I'm feeling this, let me do it. Mm. Because when things get boring, you're like, are you still feeling it? Mm -hmm. If you're not feeling it, who the fuck else is going to care? Yeah. So like with Poisonous, sometimes I would, we'd book studio. I'd be the first one there. No one would show up. I would just record verses and hooks and bridges and just leave 16 bar gaps. <laughs> just great. like, yeah, here you go. Like, do you know what I mean? Wow. Sometimes they'd use them, sometimes they wouldn't. But like, I couldn't just sit there and be like, oh, I'll just wait for Tony. Especially Tony. Yeah. I mean, wait for Tony. Just Tony, but my God. <laughs> <laughs> so you were kind of the producer role for Poisonous as well? No, I would say I was more a sort of de facto manager. Yeah. Initially, it was definitely me and Revs. But then I just think I've got skills in this kind of area of just like bore, the boring shit that rock stars don't want to do. Mm -hmm. I'm quite good at that boring stuff. Mm -hmm. The admin, like sorting out studio time, like making sure everyone needs to be where they need to be. Yeah. Speaking to certain people. And then... Like I don't, I didn't, I didn't, didn't mind the responsibility because I looked at those three as rock stars, Revs, Ferra, T, and you don't want your rock stars arriving on time or doing a admin or replying to emails. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it yeah. ruins the enigma. You no, know, it does. It does. It does. It's like, oh. <laughs> at the same time, you got to get shit done. Right. And our actual manager was useless, so right. I, I took a lot of that. I shouldered a lot of that burden. But to be fair to Revs, Revs was just a wicked person to help out with that shit because he's got so much energy and he's way smarter than me right do you know what I mean so it was like that was quite a good organizational nice combo yeah 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 that sounds great 
Um, obviously, you went into a little stint of movies and films. You were part of the Star Wars franchise. You've done stuff with 101 Dalmatians with Disney. You've been on a show called Suspicion. Mm -hmm. Suspicion. Uh, but me and me and the rest of the stumbled on, which was quite quite a cool detective kind of show. Uma Thurman. Uma Thurman. Crazy. Yes, you've done stuff with Uma Thurman. Ro you've done stuff with Rosie Perez. Yeah. You're on the same, you, you shared credits with very, you've done a show with her. And even with that Star Wars franchise, Forrest Whitaker. Oh my God, it's, it's you know, mad You've when done you some amazing it. things. And you've got Black Mirror coming up. I'm really excited about that. But what I really want to talk to you about is your return to music. <laughs> I mentioned all that yeah. just to say you got a new album. Yeah, man. Do More, Say Less, produced by Tony Bones. We, we celebrated a launch for it on Thursday, just mm. gone. It was a great atmosphere. It was great, great sounding album. Uh, shout outs to Jackson B yeah. on the sax. Saxophonist. Um, seven year hiatus from mm. the last release of because you, you you kept doing music, but, you know, mostly features. Mm. But what what was the? I know you kind of explained it on the on the launch. But what was the catalyst that made you want to get back in and 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 with the chemistry with Tony as well? When we with him. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you like the album, by the way. Yeah, um, I, I, just, I think like. Covid and then the writer strike and then the actor strike it was like a triple whammy on my industry and um, it made things really really hard and it continues to make things really really hard for people at the mid level. So I would describe myself as very much at the mid level. I'm like I'm a character actor. I'm not a number one in any movie or TV show. I'm like supporting cast. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? I know exactly my level and and I love it. Yeah. The issue with that is if your face and name don't sell movies and TV shows, when so little is being made as as it is right now, yeah, you are like one of the first disposable items, I right? That, yeah. So me and a, a lot of other actors my level and all everybody like who, who's like sort of starting out, who maybe had a few roles here or there, it's fucking tough for us. And the same with the crews, you know, because if less is being made, we've got all these crew members of every department scrambling around for work and it's affecting people really directly, like their mortgage, their rent, you know what I'm saying, stuff like that. So it's really tough. And I thought, I mean, I worked throughout COVID and I just thought, I'm bulletproof. I did Star Wars during COVID. Yeah. I did Cinderella for Amazon during COVID. Yeah, yeah. I did Persuasion for Netflix during COVID. Crazy. Do you know what I mean? Two big movies and a massive series in covid so i was just like ah, i'm bulletproof but then the strikes the cost of covid and then the strikes back to back just deaded it and the ripples were felt around the world so i don't know if you've noticed like right now as we're recording this if you look at the top 10 the charts uh, for movies in the uk mm -hmm. in the us as well bare reissues bro like gladiators in the that's top a, 10 that's a good point i think back to the future is about to be in the top 10 um wow uh, that's crazy yeah, there's a bunch. Like, there's That's a. Crazy. Oh, Carrie, Carrie. Carrie. Uh, so oh, Carrie. You, oh, Carrie. Yeah. Carrie. Uh, you know. There's the 70s. Carrie. 70s, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think it's, it reflects what's happening right now. So, anyway, long story short, there's a, there's a, <laughs> there's a huge lull period after I, I finished Black Mirror. And I, when I finished it, I was just like, now I'm flying. You know, surely I just walk onto the next set. <laughs> Doop. That's the funny thing about the acting game. Every, when it job comes to end, you're you're done. You got to start again. You got into it's like for people outside of show business, it's like interviewing for your job yeah. every few weeks. It's crazy. <laughs> isn't it? it's, 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 you know how horrible an interview is. Yeah, doing that every few weeks. Like if if I if you see me in three things in one year, that's amazing for me because that means I've probably done fifty, sixty auditions and got three of them. Right. It's, it's brutal. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, and there's nothing to do. I start to get down because I need to feel like I'm useful creatively. Well, sorry. I know not to pivot away from the album, but you during that time, that's, that's when the Just Eat advert happened? Just Eat happened in COVID. COVID. And okay. it was, actually, so that was the one well. amazing thing yeah, uh, from through. a business point of view COVID, that came out of COVID because COVID was sort of the worst time for everybody around the world and you got people dying from it and you got like all sorts of weird things being born like people becoming obsessed with conspiracy theory and spending too much time in their own heads and starting to get weird like people got a bit weird during covid absolutely. you know what i'm saying absolutely but one huge benefit of people being locked on their screens 
and delivery drivers being like the fucking heroes of COVID. <laughs> like, true. was like people needed shit like Just Eat. Mm-hmm. So it was just like the stars aligned. And you wrote for Lato. Wrote for Lato, Christina Aguilera, Christina Aguilera and Katy Perry as and well. Katy Perry as well. Those adverts are iconic, man. Yeah, been, they've been winning a few awards in that in that world. Like it's 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 been really really good to me, man. Um, so you did that, yeah. and then you so that was the all time, done. I didn't have, have anything time. to do, yeah. bro. Like just walking the dog, doing DIY. It felt like COVID. I was just in my own head, like the whole time, just fucking like boy, I just. I had scripts, ideas to finish, but I just couldn't energize myself to do them. And just like, what, well, occasionally going to parties, see your friends, but I just thought like, I'm not achieving, I haven't earned the party. You know when you drink a beer and you're like, I haven't earned this beer, I haven't done <laughs> shit today. You know, you play football or you come out of work and you have a beer, that beer, is, that beer bangs, bro. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? It bangs. Totally agree with what you're You've saying. You've done fuck all all day, what have you done? You walk the dog, what? And now you're getting a reward. <laughs> fuck, fuck out of here, man. Totally agree with you. So yeah, I started to get down, and then Instagram, like, it's just the algorithms, isn't it? Like, there was this guy. I wish I could remember his name, because I should give him a shout out. I think he's like Co- Korean American uh, mm. hip hop producer. Just posts his instrumentals, you know, that he's he's working on, and then every single one of them is fucking sick. But the I mind was, design, no. I should, no. You know what? If you said it, it might ring a bell but anyway yeah, yeah. um so like, i was always like just liking his stuff and then you know once you do that it like pops up in the explore or like as you're just scrolling through it's always going to be his shit that pops up or other stuff that sounds like it and this is like sort of just really comforting kind of i don't know sort of like nostalgic type rap but brand new with like very brand new uh approaches to production so it felt fresh loved it and the thing that was like that was a Tony Bones beat that just popped Sick. up. And I was like, ah, oh, that's the same. It's like, you know, I like that shit. And then I just, the way I just wanted to freestyle to both of those guys' beats, I actually clicked on Tony's page and like, oh, fuck, there's loads of them. Like, every single one, bang up, bang up, bang up, bang up, bang up. It made me want to freestyle. So then I just DM'd him. I was like, bro, send me a beat. I love just that. bored. Love that. And that was it. Like he sent me 10 beats. I wrote to seven of them, used two of the other ones for like ad, little advert promo things. Yeah. He's nine out of 10 of the beats he said. N- literally never happened to me in my life. <laughs> like back when I was rapping like all the time, when I was a kid, I'd get beat CDs from everybody. You get someone send you like 50 beats on a CD. Right. I listen through all of them. I hate all of them. I'd feel so bad that I'd write to one of the beats just so it would be would, like, I wouldn't have to say like, he sent me 50 <laughs> and I wasn't feeling one out of 50. I'd just write to one real quick, send it back like. There you go doesn't turn into anything but ah oh, well you know never yeah, mind yeah. Uh, I just didn't want to be like <laughs> yeah I hear you I hear you I don't want to be and I didn't want to be the guy who like doesn't even like holler back you know I got, I got to holler back with satin yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Tony okay. was just like seven out of ten I wrote to them and like maybe three of those seven ended up on the album like we started working at a ridiculous rate really early on and that was end of December 2023 into January 2024 and I just kept thinking there's going to be a job around the corner, like a real job, TV, film, like my actual job. And that didn't happen. And then I thought, oh, maybe an advertising thing will come in. No. So I was a bit like, well, I enjoy doing this. Mm. It's costing me time and money, mm. but I enjoy doing it. And it makes me feel like I've achieved something at the end of the day. Yeah. So I started going down to Bournemouth, to Tony's studio. I think the first time we actually met in person, he, he was like, uh, there's a studio that I use in London, but it's in the middle of fucking nowhere. So sorry, but or you can come to Bournemouth. And I was like, no, let's do the one in London. I've got a car, I can travel. Like it's fine. Where is it? He goes, I was in this place called Park Royal. I was like, bro, seven minutes from my house. Mm. <laughs> I love that. That's crazy. He thought, he so thought that's for you started. that was like, yeah, so, yeah. And 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 as you should, because if you look at Park Royal on the <laughs> map, it's in the middle of fucking <laughs> no, no nowhere. Way. Yeah. <laughs> wow so, th- th- so that's when they started cooking more and cause yeah. the chemistry is really good between you two even like even i know he's he's quite um quiet yeah but, yeah. but when he's on the mic he gets into it he has like the perfect wingman yeah. he's the yeah. perfect wingman because if i had a rapper hyping me they'd probably hype every other bar and i, f- I actually find it really distracting i agree 
I agree. Like I think- even with Jackson, like we were doing that song, Sorry, Sorry, I'm Still, Sorry, We're Still Here. And the two rehearse, two or three rehearsals we'd done, he was playing over the uh, verse as well. And I was like, actually, I can't deal with that. Just, I just come in, with, in, in the chorus because sometimes the bars are so intricate. I just need to let them breathe yeah. completely. And I can, it, I can find it off putting to the point where I'll forget the next bar. Mm. It just jars me a little bit. Mm. And Tony's like the perfect level because he's not a rapper. So he just comes in on the very opportune moments. And because he's not an all out and out performer although he's not afraid of being on stage yeah that's it his position to the performer the central performer is going to be perfect you're never going to be treading on each other's toes yeah whereas like i can feel it in myself if i'm featuring on someone's tune and they want me to come and perform the tune on the night or if they want me to just stay and hype i can feel my the rapper in me is just like i gotta get in there like a bit more let me do a little harmony <laughs> he's gonna love this <laughs> do you know what i mean it's like shut the fuck up man it's his show <laughs> so it kind of is perfect and yeah. i think the songs that we did actually organically rather than you know send me a beat i'll send you back a verse yeah the ones that we did like together from a blank piece of paper it's no coincidence that they're, for me they're my favorite songs yeah so like jokes interview yeah, of a vampire sorry we're still here say less and um the last track celebration they're all like done within a space where we're like let's make something and yeah. it was building 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 and then it just like explodes it's more like musicians jamming. Yeah, no, bro, definitely. You get that vibe from the album. You got, you got, you guys got great, get great chemistry and the concepts as well. Like, just feel like you were a bit. I know you said that you don't feel like you were talking much. Well, you, I, we talk about social stuff, but you like you conscious. You were being very conscious on this album. I, 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 th- I think the one thing I was really conscious of, like, excuse the pun, was to like be positive all the yeah. way through. Like, be hard. Like, hard, hard, hard. But like, just make it positive because I just think, obviously there's difficult mo- elements in my life and there's difficult things about being me, but on the whole, fuck me. Like when you look at the journey, you don't the, do- the main element, the main emotion that I should reflect here should be one of celebration and, and gratefulness. Absolutely. Otherwise it's fake, like yeah. it's a bit fake. And you you covered that completely in that last song, that celebration yeah. song. Com- like, so it was, uh, that was the vibe from the start, and it was just like halfway through where I was like, you know, I actually need some cold shit tone. Like I do, like it's great all this stuff, and I'm so glad that it's all really like positive. Yeah, like let's celebrate. But like, can, can you just give yeah. me something that makes me want to like chop a dude's head off with like a fucking samurai sword? <laughs> and he was like, oh, all right. <laughs> um, in jokes, the, in the visual, I feel like you were. I don't know. It was, it was like I don't know because obviously you're, you're you're referring to being a comedian, but also mm. being a rapper. But there was like a kind of a swagger when you get into the zone of that <laughs> song. It's like you're a bit eccentric and a bit like <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wanted to be like borderline creepy. Yeah, Do you know what I mean? but that's what that's what comes across, and it's like I feel like that's done on purpose to kind of is it is that a bit of a shot at people that only want you to do jokes? A little bit, yeah. yeah. I think it's the frustration of. You know, I look at Jamie Foxx, right? He's a massive inspiration to me because he's like an old school entertainer in like the early days of Hollywood. Yeah. I'm talking about like Fred Astaire times. Yes. You had to be able to tap dance. Like Fred Astaire, he was a tap dancer, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But even if you weren't Fred Astaire, if you were on Fred Astaire level as an actor, you had to be able to do a little bit of tap dance. You had to have a bit of that in your locker. You definitely had to be able to sing in tune. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And you had to have like all these other, you had to be able to do a bit of comedy and do serious stuff as well. Nobody questioned it. And that's sort of a tradition over there. So like like I say, Jamie Foxx is inspiration because he's a sick actor. Yeah. But he can sing his fucking ass off. Absolutely. And he's funny as fuck. Like he could do, he could do 20 minutes. He could do an hour of stand up Mm -hmm. and kill it. Nobody goes, oh, like, can you just do this? Just do the thing. Totally agree. You know, in this country, in this country, for some reason, it's like, and he does this, and he does that, and I don't see myself that way. Yeah, I see yeah. myself as like a pen for hire. Like I, I, I'm, I'm an entertainer for sure. That's like the number one, and I'm an entertainer who likes to, as often as possible, write the, whatever I'm entertaining people with, and that is it. I'm a writer performer. I think it's one job, one but it just job. happens to fit these different things at different times. But for some reason, like I, British I never, culture just I've, can't. Yeah, I never understood why that was difficult for people to understand. Also, because yeah. even with me, like, I started doing rapping, but then I, I, I did a lot of comedy stuff early, even yeah, with my yeah. raps. So there was always like, so you, you are 
com- com- comedian and a rapper now. I said, I've always rapped. So, you, well, okay. It's like, they, I don't know why they find it. It's, like you can't be different people. You, you it's, just a, it's different sides to everybody. Exactly. So, it's, for me, it reflects more of the human experience from an artist's pers- perspective. And I think it's it's tonal. So, like, if you listen to Prime Eminem, yeah. and people will get upset about this song and not about that song, and the song they get upset about, you listen to it and go, he's clearly joking here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like exactly. if you can't tell the difference between, you know, hi, my name is, and like say goodbye to Hollywood. That's right. Then you're just not listening close enough. You're not. Like it, it, tonally, he would tell you, M, um, in his prime. I this I'm actually fucking serious about this, and I'm fucking joking about this. Mm-hmm. Two different voices, just like a normal human being. Absolutely. When someone's talking to you seriously about something, you know that that's heartfelt or they're going through or their family's going through, you don't go, oh, bro, that's a good one. Exactly. Uh, let me tell you a story about myself. No, you're fucking listening because the tone, the body language of that person shows you it's serious. Mm. But for some reason, with the veneer of entertainment, people can't go, so wait, what? Uh, uh. So it's more about, you know, rather than attacking any individuals or any scene or industry, it was more just a way of going, you can do both. It's yeah. fine. And the actual experience of doing it was so weird. It was, I, it was like the equivalent of patting your head and rubbing your tummy because it felt so unnatural rapping in a serious way and moving like a like a cheesy comedian. <laughs> it, it was so hard not to just like do the rap hands and like bop to the beat and, and spit, do you know what I mean? And fucking just give it all your rap shit. It was really weird mm. emotion actually the performance of it. But I I just, I thought, I want to make it sort of slightly nightmarish. Yeah, I love it. I love it. It's, 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 it's oh, like nightmare. It's kind of yeah, creepy. Yeah, so yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not funny, yeah, yeah. but everyone's laughing. It's a bit <laughs> like a sort of dream. It's like a bad dream. Mm-hmm. That's why I wanted like the slow-mo bits around like manic. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, like cracking up and nothing funny has been said. So it's like, it's just like a real simple lesson of like, there's drama and there's comedy. Yeah. They're both brilliant. They both can be appreciated in different ways. Today, I want you to enjoy the drama, you know? Yeah. Tomorrow, I want you to enjoy the comedy. And then you get situations like the launch party where without really planning it, it became like a serious rap show with comedy and weaved was, into yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind yeah. of bizarre. Yeah, it was. In a way, that show was the best way for anybody who doesn't understand what I'm about to just show them it was. Do you know what I mean? I, I can't explain it. So just let me just, let me just show you. Because I could give a person who's not into rap and maybe likes comedy or vice versa the album and they go, hmm, yeah, okay, it's good. Here's what I think he's trying to say. But when I see him in interviews, he's like laughing and joking. It feels yeah. like incongruous. If you just see me perform it, I think it just all makes way more sense. No, I, I agree. Totally you know what I mean? I, I totally agree with that. I had friends that are long life fans of yours through comedy and didn't know about your earlier work as mm, a yeah which is totally fair enough and and then but they were blown away uh, like, which oh, is a lovely okay. thing i like i i never feel away maybe when i was younger a little bit when people don't realize that I, i'm i'm serious about this shit like i've, I've always been serious about it I, they, they don't remember that well because why would they it was not on that level. of course of course Do you of know what course. i mean so it like, just slightly annoy me a bit, though. The reason, I mean, why, the reason it, why I say that. I think what annoys me is probably the tea thing most because it, it's a lot of people's opinion that that's the best thing I've ever done. It's the biggest thing I've ever done, rap-wise. It's not the best thing you've ever done. It's, I wrote it in 15 minutes. Exactly. It's, but but it, what annoys me about that it's, is it's there's a still bit, skill, like but there's a, skill in that. Of course there is. So I'm not like, belittling it. I don't know it. if they can, you, can you not listen to, like, you can you tell terms. he's a wordsmith. You can tell you're a wordsmith. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Lyricist. Yeah, 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 yeah. But in rap terms, just like straight up rap, 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 yeah. rap. Like, I w- created that song to be simplistic enough for people that don't give a fuck about rap, maybe even hate rap, to enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Did not write that for people who love rap. People who love rap that like it, great. That makes my day because, like, that's ABC shit mm-hmm. to me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Flow wise, yeah. no, definitely delivery. Definitely, you know, it's a, a clown in here. Yeah, like, yeah. I'm making it as basic as possible so that you understand it. Also, it's weird that I recorded those songs because I designed them all for the stage. So the pauses were there for the audience to react, laugh, 
and then get back in. They weren't really designed to be listened to yeah. and appreciated in that way. But if, if people do that, then great. But if you want rap music, I'm telling you, I could do some shit and you'll enjoy it and you'll be able to return to it in in a, in a way that would be, surprise you that you appreciate it. You know, we're gonna wrap up soon. I'm gonna have a lot. Of, just a few rapid questions for yourself. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Up. Yeah, as you can tell, I'm not good at one word answers. No, you're but... amazing. You're amazing. <laughs> this has been great, and you're amazing to talk to, man. Um, the greatest of all time, rap wise. Oh fuck it. <laughs> what? Mount Rushmore then? If you can't answer that one, Mount Rushmore. Who's your? How many heads on Mount Rushmore? Four. Four. That's a much better question. I think. Okay, let's go for that. Still hard though, and then I want a Mount Rushmore films. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Um, all right. To make this sort of make sense in my head, I'm gonna choose one person from a completely different era. Okay, fair enough. Because if I ch choose four from now or four from ten years ago, for it's just gonna be too much debate. So I would say, eighties, cool G rap. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Nineties. <sighs> I've just got to be honest with myself. I'm not going to say be what honest, everybody man. else exactly. is going to say. For, for me, it's between Nas and Prodigy. I love those answers. That's crazy. And, and uh, Prodigy is nowhere near the level of artist that Nas is. But I've just but. to be honest with myself, like what made me fucking lose my shit? Prodigy, man. I throw a TV at you crazy. Yeah. Bitches say P you crazy. crazy. Pain, Pain in the, the ass. ass. Nah, fuck you. Pay, Pay me. me. I'm no shorty. Nigga, I'll stop, stop your glory. glory. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Dude. Yeah. He had so many quotes. I, so many quotes. It just moved me on some next so level. So many, yeah. Whereas not as obviously as a better artist. Yeah. Deeper, like way right, more out. You can output. share those two. But you can share those two. I like that. I'd like, I want, I'd like to have one from each era, I think. So where are you going for 2000? I can't believe I'm not saying Buster oh, rhymes for any of these, but um, yeah, Buster's in that. But you, so I'm assuming that did you want? I'm gonna say you want to make a did you want to make a decision between Nas and Prodigy? I think I might have to to okay. to, to stick to my own rule. Let's I'm gonna go first. Cool G rap Prodigy. This is mad. Just two Queensbridge okay. rappers, <laughs> <laughs> three Queensbridge rappers. I think Queensbridge speaks to Londoners. Yeah, London yeah. rap fans. Yeah. I think there's some kinship there Definitely. somehow. Something about the grayness, the shadowy, dark murkiness. <laughs> Of Do you know what I mean? Coming from the bridge. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would um, say so. 2000s. I mean, Eminem's got to be there. Like, uh, I was a massive M fan. The early M. Like uh, me, and Eminem, Shady? me and Eminem, our relationship comes to an abrupt end. Yeah. After Say Goodbye to Hollywood, what, the Eminem show. That's, it just ends there. Right. That said. I did like recovery though. No, I just no. no? It, 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 like He's, for me, it's Slim Shady LP, Marshall, Marshall Mathers, Mathers, the Eight Mile soundtrack, the Eminem, Eminem show. Yeah. What else was in that era? Did, did, did some D twelve? Did some D twelve? Yes, and some of the D twelve stuff. But yeah, those four, I just think. And obviously, amazing. you would have enjoyed his earlier stuff before Slim Shady. LP, yeah, yeah, like his mixtapes and yeah, yeah, I didn't know that much about him to be honest. Like, oh, yeah. Just the two of us was the first place just I heard him. Just the two of us, yeah. him and Haley. Ninety eight. Um, and so Kyle. yeah, maybe M for the the early 2000s and then the modern era this is this is super controversial because okay. people are going to be like what are we talking about but for me it's Getz oh okay I mean I love Getz so that that's that's alright with me I just like the for me like I love American, American rappers I can list a hundred that have like inspired me moved me influenced me but where rap really makes sense to me is when a British person does it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's like the final piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Like, I can feel everything an American rapper says and it can really, really fucking touch me. But if it's a British rapper saying it, then there's a cultural connection that makes it deeper. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. So, like, for me, the greatest rap song, of, British rap song of all time is, is Murdo because Kalashnikov, because the way it makes me feel, it makes me feel like Shook Ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, it's yeah. from my fucking yeah, town. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. That's our Shook Ones. That's our Shook 100%, 100%. Ones. 100%. So Shook Ones is the greatest rap song of all time if you're of a certain vintage like me. Shout but Murder's better because, not because it's a better song. Of course you can argue Shook Ones is better like till the cows come home. But because of what it means to me. Yeah. Just got that one extra element. Mm -hmm. The dude's from here, bro. Mm -hmm. Like he's mm -hmm. ours. Yeah, bro. 
100%. Harry Love is ours. Yeah, yeah. Clash is ours. Yeah. So when I first heard Gets, yeah, man. I was like, he was a big game. It was the passion, the 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 righteous anger, the indignation, and then it was the humor. I think there's also a Jamaican thing going on there that really speaks to me. Yeah. That it's not explicit, but if you've grown up around Jamaicans, there's, there's just something in it. Like, for me, he's swaggier than any other rapper, and part of it's because he's Jamaican. No disrespect That's to okay. the Trinidadian. Nah, he's just got this. Like, I, I have. Thing. I think. I think Trinidadians would agree. Jamaicans, they they got some next when it comes to something swag. Else. There's something else, bro. Dennis the flow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's never the same twice. Never. Like he's like Pharaoh Munch or or or, or um uh, um Black Fort. Mm -hmm. He's creating styles mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. every time he touches the mic. Cool G as well. Every time I touch the mic, I'm giving you that Doc Brown flow. Like sometimes I switch it up, but it's like this is the shit that I created. I love it and it's yeah. timeless. Yeah. Most rappers are like that. Yeah. Gets is on another level. He's creating flows, he's creating styles. He's funny as fuck. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's got all of my tick boxes and he's British. Yeah. So for me, from 2010s to now, like, if you disagree, listen to London and then come back and you'll, yeah, you'll shut no, the fuck up. Shout out to Gets, man. <laughs> Freedom of speech and um, what was it? What's, what was the. Um, 2000 and Live and all, the, all those projects that he put out early. The way he's morphed as well and changed, like you think about ghetto gospel. old school gets, yeah. like ghetto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now he's evolved as well. Yeah. And then you think about ghetto gospel, New Testament. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. like, who's showing that growth? Yeah, yeah. It's true. Like I'm out here trying to sound like I did 20 years ago. Yeah. Like <laughs> most rappers are just trying to tap into that thing that's that, like the special thing about them. That what When they had... Enthusiasm yeah. for it. Well, the special thing about him is he keeps evolving. Yeah. And he just gets colder and colder. Like, it's mad. He came out to the Lauren Hill show the other day. I was, I was there like, on Monday last week. And he's a great guy. Yeah. yeah. He is on a top great of guy. that. Yeah, shout out to Gets all day. Mad. Um, Top four movies. And I got one last question and then that's it. Really difficult, this. I'd, I would say I'd have to base it on what I can watch anytime okay do you know what I mean like yeah. you put it on I'm watching it yeah I've seen it a billion times yeah, yeah, yeah. but you never get bored nah no. Nah. so it, on that basis I'd probably say Stand By Me with Macaulay Culkin uh, no, no with um, with um, who's in Stand By Me again River Phoenix oh yeah the Phoenix uh, brother when they were Corey young Corey Feldman yes 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 um pff. I was thinking of my girl, wasn't I? Yeah. yeah. That's what I was thinking. Not in my top four. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Stand By Me is a classic. Probably Goodfellas. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. The Jerk by Steve Martin. Oh, yes. It's the stupidest that, comedy. Was he in like Jamaican in that or something? Was he, was he, <laughs> like, what was he in that? It was never easy for me. <laughs> I was born a poor black <laughs> child. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, shout out to Steve Martin, man. <laughs> That guy needs his flowers, bro. The Jerk is, to me, the greatest comedy movie of all time. I need to watch that again. I haven't watched that in um, years, bro. I can watch it anytime, mm. any day. And then the final one could be Jaws. Jaws, I can watch. Like, if, Jaws, if there's like 20 minutes left of Jaws, I'll watch it. Great shot. I used to have a phobia of sharks, though. So. Mate, but I, I mean, know who, who, they... who's not scared it, of sharks? It, exactly. Sharks, oh, I love sharks, mate. Love them. Every time I see one <laughs> swimming into the shallows, I'm like, oh, brilliant. This is going to be so much fun. As you started tapping more into the comedy game, was there any, any huge influence? I mean, I guess... Yeah, I guess well, there's comedians. Yeah, yeah. Bill Burr. Yeah, I love Bill Burr. Bill Burr changed the game for me. A bit. I think probably Bill and J.B. Smooth. Yeah. Like, <laughs> J J Larry? J.B. Smooth was like <laughs> such a fearless improviser. Oh, and Patrice O'Neill. Um, yeah, yeah. Also yeah. fierce in improviser. Yeah. I, I love guys who can think on their feet. Mm -hmm. Um... But I Bill, always, Bill Burr changed up. the game because I was like, this is actually interesting on loads of levels. This is a working class guy, uneducated, who's making wild points um, that come from a lack of knowledge. And yet he's incredibly smart. That's right. I thought that was like an interesting angle. Then the second interesting angle is that his wife was black. He's immersed in black culture. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to be black. Mm -hmm. 
He's very like aware of who he is. Mm -hmm. White bread, ginger, mm -hmm. aggressively white. Mm -hmm. And he's addressing that shit mm -hmm. without pandering to white liberal audiences or bl or black sensibilities. And I think that's why he used to kill it on the black circuit yes, because he, he wasn't apologizing. He wasn't coming in and going, hey, it's white guys. I oh, know it's a bit awkward. Blah, blah. He was coming in and going, you know what the fuck is wrong with you lot? I and black that. people loved love it because yeah. it's like, yeah. this guy's got the balls to say it yeah, and yeah, yeah. back it. Like the, say that in rowdy crowds like Philadelphia bro, and all that. Yeah, you yeah, ever yeah. seen his bit about um, ashiness? I don't think I have, you know. You, you talk about ashy skin, black ashy skin. So he's saying like, he was like, what the fuck is that? And he's like, he's like, my wife, like she basically gets up and dunks herself in a fucking vat of, of lotion. <laughs> Just cream and everything. Like, why are you doing that? She's like, I don't want to be ashy. What the fuck is that? And she explains like ashy, like you're ashy. He's like, no, no, what are you talking about? She just like scratches his knee and like just like, whoosh, like flakes oh, coming over. He's like, oh my god, I'm ashy. <laughs> <laughs> and he just tells this whole story about being ashy, but it ends in that brilliant way of like, it's like the perfect way to kill racism dead. Yeah, talk about all the awkward shit right. with someone who's the opposite race. That's as right. he, like all the awkward shit, all your prejudices, vice versa air them out it's like i don't not like you mm -hmm. you don't not like me but we've never mixed with each other's cultures do you know what i'm saying like i don't not like this dude from the philippines or whatever but i don't have any filipino friends right. so i'm gonna have prejudices right. and vice versa so let's hang and talk about them because i think they're funny it's like i was saying before little sort of slightly racist things are funny and yeah, the more yeah. you talk about them the more you eradicate serious racism right because racism comes from fear that's right fear of the unknown that's right when you're scared you get angry that you're scared mm -hmm. you're like you're a man you're a woman you're a big adult you don't want to piss your pants you don't want to feel scared you're angry that something made you scared and people who get angry for being scared they're the exact type of people racism suits them perfectly mm -hmm. i'm angry that these guys exist why because deep down i'm scared i'm scared and i don't know them facts they're a danger they're a facts. threat yeah bill like just cut straight through that with that joke because the way the bit ends and I could never do it justice but the way that bit ends he's like this is how to eradicate racism we, we gotta talk like now I know I'm ashy and I know how to correct that thank fuck <laughs> thank, thank you black people it's about he goes it's about a cultural exchange you know so I'll, I'll be in the car going like you got a license for that weapon you know really you gotta dude you gotta get licenses man well, you got a fucking car you got a gun in the car with no you got a gun in the car with no fucking like, do you know what I mean? He's like, well, Ashley, but he's like, he's good, he's telling, you know what I'm saying? And yeah, in that he's moment, brilliant. he's going like, people might say it's racist, but there's black guys driving around with fucking unregistered guns <laughs> and they're going to prison for 20 years for no reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he's saying something controversial that really a white person should be allowed to say about a black person, but he showed you this is the dialogue I have yeah. because I'm immersed in black culture. I didn't plan to be here. I yeah. fell in love with a black person. Yeah, yeah. So now I'm learning. Yeah. I love Brilliant. That. I love that. He's a huge inspiration. Yeah, he's, he's next So level. if you think back to the stuff I was doing in stand-up, a lot of it was about what I'd learned from a mixed race perspective. Right. Come, being between two worlds. All of my comedy really is about being in the middle. Right. Like coming from a working class background and becoming middle class, you know? Yeah. And now my kids are posh, bro. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, what's yeah, happened. Yeah, yeah. Like, again, I'm in the middle. So... For me, it's like I'm I'm like a conscious observer of these two worlds. I'm constantly caught between them. And for me, I always find it quite funny. Like, huh. <laughs> and the things that people think they can say or do around you, you know, if a middle class person assumes you're middle class, or if a working class person assumes you're working class, if a black person consi considers you, you completely black, or a white person considers you like, more on our team. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> the things that people will say it's and do, so like, it's, I find that all of that, interesting yeah and i'm an expert at code switching because yeah. because of that yeah well you have so to. like i can i can be comfortable if i'm the only person from a working class background in a room i can be comfortable as the only person of color That's so or i can be comfortable as the only person who's not quite the same color as all the other people of color in the room yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. i've been dealing with it since i was born uh, exactly so um yeah i think it's it's rich it's a rich place to start comedy from amazing um doc are we gonna have any more music Definitely. I'm glad to hear that. Definitely. You I'm know, like, the diff the most difficult thing about it is it costs me time and money and I need to earn money. Of course. And, I, and I'm, I'm running out of time because life course. is not infinite. Yeah. You know, yeah. into the 40s now, it's not a joke anymore. Like, yeah. 
I need to make sure the next 10 years, my my kids are good. And then I can just sort of relax a bit. 100%. Take my pension. Chill, bro. Highest of highs and lowest of lows. Okay. Um, In terms of your life? What, so what have you been through? Maybe start with the lowest of lows? Yeah. We're going to end on a high point, right? Okay. Lowest of lows. <laughs> <laughs> I would say they got, a, got to a point in stand-up where I didn't realise how lonely I was. I didn't realise how alone I'd been, been in for how long. Okay. And I knew I had to stop doing it. It's 2017. Because that job, you write it yourself, you create it yourself, write it yourself. You travel on your own, you perform it on your own, and then you kill or you die on your own. Right. Because you, you don't need anyone else. You can bring other people, but then you got to pay them. Yeah. And I was just, I was so much like, i got to get this pee. I was like maximizing the fact that all you need to do is turn a mic on and then I get all the money. But what I realized after nine years was like, fuck it, I'm totally on my own with this. Like sometimes your friends come to a gig, but like your night off might be Monday. You call your friends, like, bro, it's fucking Monday, man. Like, I've got yeah. work tomorrow. Like, yeah. You want to wild out and you got the money to do it. Like no one. Or worse, you're not even in your ends. Yeah. You're in fucking Helsinki. Right. You, you, there's no one to party with if you got like crazy adrenaline from killing it yeah. in a club in Helsinki. There's no one to celebrate with. If you die in that club in Helsinki and you feel like you want to shoot yourself in the fucking face, there's no one there to go, bro, like, it's, it's calm, man. Like, you're going to be sick tomorrow. You're just in your head and you're far from home and you're doing that every yeah. single day. You're missing birthdays. You come back, you're in town, you go for a drink with your friends. Like, oh, how's it going with that chick, man? Bro, I broke up with her like six months ago. You're a shit friend. Like, you don't even know what's going on. Yeah. You don't, you're not seeing your kids. I was just like, I suddenly thought, I can't do this, man. And the emotional highs and lows, like you kill, you think you're a god. You die, you think you're a piece of shit. Right. It's like, I can't do this every day. Fuck it. Best decision I ever made. So the lowest of the low was probably in Amsterdam 2017 where I was just like, I was on tour with Gervais as well. I was just like, I think I'm done, man. Well done. Yeah, Good I need to you. I need to be around people. Yeah. Look at me. Look at the way I talk. Like, I need company, man. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I go mad. So That is crazy. Yeah, yeah. That was the lowest. The highest is easy. On stage, hosting the, uh, the BAFTA Britannia's Beverly Hills Hotel, front row, Jennifer Lawrence, Jake Gyllenhaal, Jodie Foster, Ang Lee, uh... Ewan McGregor, Samuel L. Jackson, uh, Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks. Yeah, I remember that. I remember. I remember. I texted you. High point. I, like I texted you. And I was like, I'm watching did you? you I, I texted you. I said, I'm watching you, the Baptist man. You smashed because then you didn't do an introduction with Tom Hanks or something like that. I did. I, I hosted the whole. You thing. You hosted bro. the whole thing. That's right. No, I know you hosted the whole thing, but did did you not call him up on stage or something? I did. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I said, oh, you smashed it, bro. I'm so proud of you. And you were like, oh, thanks, Gilly. I had to improvise so much of that as well, like. I was just so proud of myself, man. Nah, as you should, I was very proud of you, bro. You, you, you and I opened it. with a fucking rap. I was like, "This is how far I can take this yeah. shit." You smashed it. It was bro. an amazing moment. Yeah, best thing I've ever. I mean, I've done so many amazing things, but the way I felt because it was quite stressful dealing with all that that level of celebrity and production around it and all of that. The way they have you work it, like they'd get you in the office every day, like right. in Santa Monica, and you'd have to perform what you were planning to do wow. to like four guys in an office, and of course, it's dead. Like. Wow. And on the night, I just did my own thing. I love that. Because Gervais told me, I was like, the stuff that, the way they've edited my shit that I've written, it just feels really vanilla now. He was like, are they going to edit you like, on the night? Someone going to come up and go, oh, you can't say that. I was like, well, obviously not. I ruined the thing. He goes, so do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> Shout out to Ricky Gervais, man. He definitely does that. He, he lives by he, that. He said, he said like, if you get in trouble, it's going to be afterwards. Like, it's done. I love that. It's done. What are they going to do? Erase the tape? Exactly. No. Nah. He's like, you're not an offensive comedian. You're not going to upset anyone. Do the thing that you think is the funniest for you. Big Great advice. Yeah. And it was there's best night in my life professionally. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a great interview. <laughs> Thank and you, um, yeah, uh, all the best to you. And I can't wait to see what you do next, man. Nice honestly. one, bro. I'm always no, a fan. Appreciate it. That's been Skillet's World. We're out.